doing what I feel like the Lord's gifted me to do, which is to encourage and point in the right direction. But I tell you, it just felt like a cloud all afternoon. Because I see the devil at work again. And I remind you, he ain't going to give up until he's thrown in the lake of fire. But I'm telling you, he will give up one day. Amen. I tell you, it's just since coming in here, I've had my spirit lifted. Because I've been reminded that my king wins. And he's going to get every one of us, all of his children, home safe. Such a simple truth. But I don't know about you, but I have to be reminded that every once in a while. One day, we'll stand before him face to face. What a day. What a day. Sing about it, we can't even come anywhere close. Because the song said, I can only imagine. Oh, my soul, why is a man? No way, no way. We're just that much closer home. We're going to do this thing together, church. We're going to get on with the power and the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ, with the Spirit of God filling our hearts, encouraging us along the way. Staying in the Word and saying, Lord, what do you have to say to me? That's a lot of money. God, what do you have to say? I choose to trust you. And I'm going to press on. I'm going to go on. Because one day, one day, and it can be before we get out of here tonight. One day, it's going to happen. Sing it out again, church.
his little word of remembrance. Especially as it relates to this particular song and the message that's behind it. In my regular Bible reading this week, that word jumped off the page and uh, in a different sense to me, and I saw it in a way that I've never seen it before. And certainly we can relate to this. I was in the 105th Psalm. And verse 5 says, Remember his marvelous works, which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. And that's the message of this song all the way through. We will remember what he has done. And we glorify him. We praise God. We just give thanks to him. I kept reading along, and all of a sudden, there was another message came out. That I've never seen this before, not in this life. In verse 8, it says, He, speaking of God, remembers His covenant forever. The word which He commanded for a thousand generations. Verse 42, same chapter. For He, God, remembered His holy promise and Abraham, His servant. Now, folks, we know we, God doesn't have to be remembered, uh, be reminded like we need to be reminded. Oh, I remember now. I said I was going to do what, and I forgot. Can I remember, remind you God doesn't forget? And the word, the sense there in the reading of the word is that the author said God will never forget. Many people, even in the Christian church, believe that God's forgot about Israel. Can I remember, remind you, God has not forget, forgotten about it. God's plan is still in place. A lot of people want to adopt the promises, some of the Israel's promises, and apply them to the church, and you come up with all kinds of heretical teaching when you do that. Folks, God has not forgotten Abraham. He has not forgotten the promises that he made to him. He has not forgotten any of the marvelous, wonderful words of truth regarding his covenant toward us, the church, forever and ever and ever and ever. And before I'd ever come across this song, the Lord put that on my heart to include tonight. I, I just said, and I camped out with that for a while. Lord God, thank you for remembering Phil Whitaker. Thank you for remembering your church. Thank you for telling us you're never going to forget us. That's what he's saying. I'll never forget you. Why? Because he's faithful. Because he's who he says he is. He's a God that can be trusted. He's the omniscient one, the all-knowing one. He's the immutable one, the one who never changes. The same yesterday, today, and forever. That's my God. And we worship him this evening. We glorify him. We praise him. What a great God we serve. Sing with me one more time.
to the great God that we serve. Praise the Lord Almighty. You may be seated. <laughs> All right, take your Bibles and turn over to 1 Corinthians. We're about two-thirds through, so we'll not be long tonight. Now you have to be a certain age to understand this. If you're over 50, you're enjoying the new orchestra. If you're under 50, it's a band. All right? Well, boy, they're doing good, aren't they not? They really are. Thank them all. And uh, Miss Beverly is our new flautist. Is that what they call it in French? That's a flute player. And if we can find a clarinet, Miss Debbie's going to step up and play the clarinet. She's pretty good at it. She played for years in our orchestra in the last two churches. So uh, we're going to see where the Lord builds that. I've had a few ask, uh, how many are you going to get? You know, I'm going to tell you what Westside did. When they prayed for an orchestra, they said, Lord, you build it. And we'll see how it came together. And it came together in an incredible manner. So that's what my answer is. We're, we're not going to put a number on it. We're going to see what Ray can blend and... What Brother Phil can blend, and we'll just see where it goes. And uh, I know the church has never really had an orchestra, but if you ever have one that the Lord turns loose on, it makes an incredible difference in the uh, services and all that takes place. And so uh, maybe you're talented enough to help play. You might talk to Ray and he can see if he can blend you in. If you're not talented and you think you play, don't talk to him, all right? <laughs> Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. And uh, we're looking in chapter 2 of Corinthians, beginning in verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, and neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but with the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And Father, thank you tonight for bringing us together. Lord, we know many people are missing tonight, but you're not missing here tonight. We know many of our people have been ministering at the race, and we pray for them. We pray that spiritual food has been planted in people's lives that never have any opportunity any place else, or take the opportunity. We pray tonight that this would be a, a blessing unto people's lives and what it is that you want to say to our hearts. And so open our hearts that we might hear your word tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, all right. We are about halfway through the second point, and we're looking at the Holy Spirit, the great teacher. I have uh, taught upon this subject before, but I've never done... Uh, uh, I've done this passage, but I've never done this message, really. And so I've added some things around to it because I think you can expound upon it. In fact, when it comes to Holy, the Holy Spirit being our teacher for life and our mentor for life and all that we could be, I, I promise you I could probably stand up here the rest of my life and teach upon that subject alone. I need you to open your mind and your heart and broaden your life in understanding what the Word of God is for. This is the manual for what God gave us to be able to walk with Him. This reveals who He is. And the Spirit's power is there within us to teach it to us, to help us to have the application of life. Listen, I know in many ways life is very difficult today for a lot of people, and there's a lot of pains, there's a lot of burdens, 
There's a lot of complicated things. But you know, I think when we think about the Lord Jesus, if you watch his life, he never got in a hurry. He never got overrun. Uh, you know, when he chose to drink the cup of sin and go to the cross, he chose to do it. And uh, he didn't have himself so scheduled up and overdone that he couldn't enjoy his life the way that he did. I, I think that is the picture of what the Holy Spirit is trying to do for us in our own life, is teach us how to live the life and be productive in what we do, and not to be lazy nor any of those things, but to be productive in what we do, and yet it be anointed of God, and it brings peace unto our heart and unto our soul. So many people are working so much in their life, trying to earn a living here upon the earth, they forget about the heavenly living that is being given to them after they become a child of God and what they're going to enjoy one day in eternity. And what you do here affects your enjoyment, by the way, there in eternity. You're going to have more freedom as you've learned to walk with Christ here upon the earth, and there's going to be a reward system. Now, it's going to be wonderful to be in heaven. Every time I bring that subject up, some people say, well, well, I haven't lived very well, and, and it's never too late. I want to say that to you. It's never too late. But yes, there is a reward system for faithfulness. Now, nobody knows exactly how that works because God gives the test to each individual. Some people have had so much light and not done anything with it. They're not going to have as much as somebody that had hardly any light and did everything they could with what little light they had. It's going to be a different type of a test than you understand. But God is going to, how we live our life here is going to affect some of the things that take place for us there in heaven. That's why the Holy Spirit of God being your teacher and being the one that mentors your life and strengthens your life and gives you the goal of magnifying Christ and leading you into victory, those things are here for our benefit. Now, we looked down and we looked, uh, first of all, uh, to be qualified for the Lord to teach you in the Spirit, you had to be saved. That's spirit salvation. You need to be clean. That's spirit justification. Then you need to be sensitive. That's spirit sensitivity. And then the next one before we go to point three is simply found in verse 16. And it is spirit submission. Look down at verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Well... You see, uh, he's telling us that here, you remember in Ezekiel, I think that's one of the great passages of Scripture that describes salvation to us when the Bible tells us and told even the Old Testament people that when he softened the heart and put the Spirit upon them, that he wrote his laws and his ways upon their heart. Listen, that's a test of salvation right there. You want to ask the question, am I really saved? You need to ask the question, do I have a God conscience? Does God put his conscience within me? Does he help me? Now, you expand that conscience by the word of God and by being filled with the spirit and by coming to church, you expand the God conscience in you. But the Bible teaches us that we know and understand God more from the moment we get the spirit of the living God. Let me explain it to you. You may not understand this unless you're, you're a preacher. But I've seen this, I don't know, in my 30-something years, I've probably seen it 500 to 1,000 times because there'll be an old boy sitting back there in the middle of the church and you can be preaching your heart out and God can be all over it and the, God can be all over the service and I mean he comes six, seven, eight weeks, a month, a year, or two years and he doesn't get it. Then all of a sudden he gets spirit salvation and he runs down the aisle and the Bible is brand new, the church is brand new, the things of God are brand new, the witness of God is brand new and all of a sudden the light bulbs come on and he's got it. He's got it. And you see, the part of the problem is, is that most of us got it and we got spirit baptized. Like the little boy said one time, he said, I backfired somewhere, preacher. <laughs> he backslid is what he did. And it's the same thing I've told you. I've told many people before. I tell it to brand new children of God that get saved and get excited and this, that, and the other. I say, just don't become like the rest of them in six months. Yeah. Don't ever get over all of it. Amen. That's what he is talking about. Don't ever get over all of it. Spirit sensitivity begins to be sensitive to the things of God. Now listen, the Holy Spirit wants to reveal not new truth beyond the Word of God, but He wants to apply truth unto your heart. Now I wrote this down this week when I was studying this, and I am convinced of this, that many people have found their spiritual life stuck, and they're not going forward whatsoever. And I'm convinced that God never takes you past a certain point till He has got you in the place He needs you to understand what He is teaching you 
at that time. Now, he can teach you more than one thing at a time. But if you're stuck and you're in a ditch and you're in a hole, understand this. It is probably a sinful pattern of some kind. And you've stopped growing because you've stopped going towards the Lord. And so there's no new lessons. Lessons of God begin to come in our life over and over and over. And he wants to take you from one hill of victory to one mountain of victory to another mountain of victory. Now, you may have to go back down in the valley and learn some lessons. Lessons are learned there also. They're learned in trials and tribulations and difficulties and, and problems. But you don't want to live there. Too many of you are still living in past spiritual experiences. Some people, this became a problem in the Baptist church. There was some great revival that came through some 10, 12, 15, 50 years ago. And some people got saved and they got in that spiritual experience. And they're still there and they've never gone any, any farther. Listen, the Holy Spirit as a teacher wants to take you on the inside of the heart by the hand of the soul and walk you through the paths of life and teach you about what life is all about. That is what his purpose is in your life. It's not just to come into this life and for you to plan your life and to go get an education and go find a mate and go have children and just haphazardly get through life. You may build up a great kingdom here, but you've not influenced the kingdom of God there. The child of God filled with the Spirit, letting the Spirit teach, wants to impact the kingdom of God all around them. Listen, I don't, I don't know my neighbors real well. I know one that's just right up the hill from me, and they've been kind of quiet ever since I got there. The neighborhood usually gets real quiet when the preacher moves in anyway. And I'm praying for the three or four, five, I just have three or four houses around me, and I'm praying for them. Some of them, I don't know their name. But have you ever thought about just praying for your neighbors that here you are, a child of God, you want to be a light in the world, you don't have to go next door and beat down the door and throw a big family Bible in their face and tell them to repent. Just pray for them and ask God to open the door for you, for you to make an impact upon their heart and upon their life. And then be ready for that opportunity. I don't know if there's any place Debbie and I have ever been, but Eldorado, Arkansas... We lived right at the end of a block. I mean, you dead-ended into my, into my driveway, and I lived on an acre. We had a beautiful, beautiful home there. The economy was already bad when we moved there, and we bought a beautiful executive home for next to nothing. And we had, uh, eight, had four neighbors on each end all the way up to the front, and most of them had lived there most of their life. Some of them went to church. In fact, our next-door neighbor was very active in a, in a little church, but, uh, and there was a a man down the street and his wife, they went to church. But I, I dare say that most of our neighbors didn't go to church on a regular basis. At least half of them. You know, through the years, we had so many times together. That was probably one of the most enjoyable neighborhoods that we ever lived in. You know, I never stood out on the end of my driveway and preached at any one of them. But we took every opportunity we could to minister to them. And it was an amazing time together over those almost nine years. Well, you remember, it wasn't long after I got here, I had to run back down to El Dorado, and our next door neighbor that we were so close to, he's, uh, he was the head deacon of a little old bitty church that runs about 35. And you know something? The West Side Bunch, Brother Ray, they came, they came pretty regularly. But you know something? Some of those folks who had never heard me preach, in fact, I understand they bought my tapes through the years, they never heard me. They started showing up at the prophecy conference and they were in every single service. I haven't followed up where they are today in their spiritual walk, really. But you know something? You talk about a blessing to a preacher thinking, have I made an impact in my neighborhood? And they loved me and Miss Debbie, and we loved them. You see, one of the things that the Holy Spirit, I think, teaches you to do is to make sure that you're living in such a manner, in such a gracious way, that you would impact your neighbors sometimes by never saying a thing to them. And they see what you have. They saw the commitment I had. They saw some of the battles we had. 
Some of them, you remember, we had the uh, homosexual battle there. I wrote that letter that I've given to you, and I guarantee you, it got hot as hotcakes. That thing went all over the South. We had to have police protection and people sleep in our driveway, and they had all kinds of threats against me and Miss Debbie, and this thing bounced on for six, seven, eight months. People sat in deer stands out in the forest out behind my house. Bubba did that, Brother Ray, and uh, it wasn't a real pleasant experience. You know something? You know who some of the people were in that time period that cared the most for this preacher were some of the people on that neighborhood that didn't even go to church? And they said, Brother Mike, don't back up an inch. We've got your back. It's amazing. Too many of you hadn't even got a friend outside of the church to make an impact in their life. That's what the Holy Spirit's purpose is. What was the whole purpose of the work of Christ in the heart? It was to submit to the Father, to do the will of God, and as he did the will of his Father, he made an impact in people's lives. And you see, if the church would ever wake up, and every child of God would wake up, that their number one job is to be like Christ in such a manner that it makes an impact in somebody's life, this church right here would explode in a natural procession of what the Spirit of God is doing in your heart. Get that? Amen. Now go over. To Romans chapter 13. And we'll do the last point about the Holy Spirit's teaching. I'll do it real quickly. Chapter 13. Beginning down in verse 11. Or actually you could begin in verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now is the high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light, and let us walk honestly in the day, not in riding, not in drunkenness, not in chambering, not in wantonness, not in strife, and not in envy. But put, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provisions for the flesh, to fulfill the lust of the flesh, Thereof. Now, here's what I'm going to give you. I'm just going to run these down. Five quick things. I want you to write them down, and I want you to see them right here out of the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit's greatest lessons in your life. All right, you got something to write with, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, mark them down for you. All right? You find the first one there in verse 11, where the Bible tells you to put on Christ. That means put on the new life. That means put Him on. doesn't mean on the outside. It's talking about on the inside. That means the way you respond, the way you react, the way you think, the way you allow Him to work in, in your life. Now, verse 11, that's the first thing. That's the greatest lesson, and that's the anchor lesson. Now listen, if you want to test, Jay Strack used to say, you're no greater a Christian than you are at home. That means how you treat your wife or your husband or your children or how your, the spirit of your house is. Do you know your home's supposed to be in such peace? It's supposed to be a little taste of heaven. By the way, that's supposed to be the church, too. They're both designed to do that. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean that everything is a spiritual revival. It's where we do our real living. But if it's always a conflict and always a problem, you've lost the heart of Christ for what the home and what the church is supposed to be about. And then you go down, and you also find here in, in uh, verse 11, I believe it is, and uh, let me get back to it. Verse 11, notice what it says. And that knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of our sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believe. Now, now listen. First of all, you find that we need to put on Christ. And by the way, that's the chapter 12 and chapter 13, the beginning part of it. Now go to verse 11. And the next lesson that the Holy Spirit wants to give to us is recognizing the time that we live in, in the last days. It is to recognize the time that we live in, in the last days. Now, I know I talk about it a lot. I just want you to look up here and tune in to me right now. Hear me very carefully. This world has never seen darkness like it's seen today. I'm sorry. Paul said in 2 Timothy, 
Welcome to the last days in chapter 3. Listen to me. We have never seen evil flooding the planet. And it's flooded the planet at times through history. It has. World War I and World War II was one of the most horrendous times of evil in all of history. Watch. It doesn't compare to what's going on today. You know why we were able to come to World War II and people said that was the war to end all wars and some people thought that the Lord was coming again? But we stomped out evil. And in less than 25 years later, we approve abortion. Deception is the key to how deep the last days go. And when a generation is as deceived as this generation is, you know that darkness and the last days are here and among us. Now listen, some people understand that in history, great revivals worldwide corrected a lot of the evil that was in the world at that time. But there's a last day's revival that doesn't correct the darkness and the evil, but it wins many, 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 many people to Christ. I believe that's where we are. I believe we're in the conflict of the ages of the last days. We're in the conflict of the culture, the society. Just, just think about this. If we've come where we have in America in 15 years, where are we going to be 15 years from now? I mean, it's horrendous. I hope I'm not misquoting or... or, or in, are improper, but I wasn't kidding about this morning. We've had the homosexual agenda in the, in the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts now. We all sat there with a sick stomach. Now it's happened, what, 18 months ago, and I guess we're kind of used to it. Now our own high school here locally has put in a transgender bathroom. Isn't that true? Man, right here in our backyard. And you just go, what in the world are people thinking about today they call this normal. God calls it evil. They call it acceptable. God calls it perversion. Listen, one of the things you must understand is that the Holy Spirit of God teaches us with wisdom how to overcome those things. Now you see, some of you want to go out and take up arms and have a big fight on correcting all that stuff. I guarantee you it's way past that. It isn't going to work. Only the Spirit can conquer the darkness. But you better let Him conquer it in your life or watch your family go right down the bottom. The way people accept and, and, and process things today is amazing. I just read an article this past week that said 70% of those young people that go to any school, including Christian, in college... 70% of them in the future will abandon their faith completely. They will become God-haters. That is frightening to me. You know, that's why I beg and plead with you to be careful not to get mad about something stupid around here because it only takes one shot to get a church fight going over nothing. We got a whole lot of things to worry about these days than some of the stuff we used to fuss and feud about and complain about. It is a bigger picture than that. And we better be careful because you see, in the last days, the first characteristic that Paul said in 2 Timothy was, the first characteristic was they were selfish in what they wanted. You know what the number one thing Adrian Rogers used to say was the worst thing to face in the church to get it going forward? was selfishness in the congregation. Wasn't adultery. Wasn't alcoholism. Wasn't dope. He said the number one thing that kept the church back was selfishness by the congregation. Last day's mentality. Entitlement enti mentality. I want what I want and I have the right to demand it. Since when? I certainly wasn't taught that as a little boy. And I knew better than that. That's why I still have my teeth. <laughs> Not really. But I, I just have, I know some of y'all may get, but I get, I get so tired of the whining and the crying of this generation 
and the demanding and the smart aleck, arrogant attitudes that sometimes go on it, and I'm talking about lost and saved, it, can you imagine what it does to the stomach of an almighty God? One of the things that has to come forth is that we learn the day that we live in. And then notice verse 12. He says, Now the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Notice what he says here. He's saying, You cast out that which is dark and the way that you do it is that you put on the armor of God and it puts on the light that God has for us. This is lesson number three. Now remember what we're studying in this point. We are talking about the five things that is the most important thing that God teaches you in how to walk with Christ. This is the application. You put on Christ. You recognize the last days. You cast off darkness and you put on the armor of light. Now let's go to verse 13. Notice what it says. It tells us now how to walk. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, not in drunkenness, not in chamberings. Get my page turned. Not in one tondness, listen, not in strife, and not in envy. You know, I think some people just love to fight. I hate a fight. It just doesn't do anybody any good. Listen to what he starts out. It says, walk honestly, and he's talking about walking honestly. Purely and stay out of these things. And then he lists them. Very careful. Stay out of wantonness. You know what wantonness is? That's what I just talked about. Have to have my way. Have to have my way. That's what divides most homes. Somebody having to have their way all the time. Somebody not wanting to get in. And listen. We're talking about how he says to walk properly. You know why he, why he uses the word walk? Because that is the picture of the Christian life, to walk in a gentle manner, which is opposite of the things that he has just listed. And then, not only in strife, he talks about envy. Get out of those things. He's, envy is jealousy and those things that create issues and, and drives you to want the, what your neighbor has or what somebody else has or to be recognized. You know, some church talent needs to humbly sit on the back row of the church for about a year to really get it sometime. Because if we're going to study the Beatitudes properly, we have to say this in the right manner. No one should step up and lead with a wrong motive or a wrong purpose. I'm number one at that, by the way. You know what he's talking about? What I'm talking about right there is out of envy and jealousy is people think that they've earned a territory or that they have an untouchable situation at the church and God can't say anything, nobody can say anything. That's what he's talking about. Happens in a lot of churches. You say, well, it hadn't ever happened here. I don't know if it has. It hadn't since I've been here, really. But it can get started in a heartbeat. I've probably made more churches mad by taking keys away from closets than anything else I've ever done. If there's anything that drives me nuts, it's committees want to own 15 closets across church, doesn't it, Ray? You know why? I've never seen as much feuding over stupid closets and material goods in a church than what I have found in backseat closets. They think they own it. Well, listen, everything belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the preacher or to you or to anybody else. I didn't spill my blood for it, and neither did you. It belongs to the Lord. Preacher doesn't know it. Deacons don't know it. Sunday school teachers don't know it. Nobody, no matter how long they've been in a church, owns anything in the place of the Holy God. Y'all are quiet. Maybe instead of saying amen, you might ought to say ouch. But it's the truth. Who said that? <laughs> oh, I, I, I had my glasses off. Number five. Look at verse 14. 
man's greatest battle, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Which, by the way, that was number one, too, to put on Christ. I missed the, the verse. And then he says to make no provisions for the flesh. Now listen, number five is simply this. Your goal to be spirit-filled and to walk like Christ and to even apply the Beatitudes that we have talked about literally means this, that you're overcoming the flesh. Overcoming the flesh. That means the Spirit of Christ is dominating and is predominant in your life and it's the Spirit of God that responds in you and not the flesh. The flesh reaps corruption. The Spirit reaps everlasting life. That's the Word of God. Now, you remember it is a battle. It's a battle you've got to win with the Lord's help. You can't do it outside of the power of God. He does it through you, with you, and empowers you to do so. Paul said it so. He's, he struggled all of his life to the day that he died, and he was graduated into full sanctification. I'm not telling you that this is going to be easy, but you can walk with Christ in such a peaceful manner that you learn the peace of Christ in such a way that you recognize when it's gone. When it's gone. You know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, Ray, I've never asked you. And Dad, I don't know if I've ever asked you this question. But I can tell you, you know what? You know what day of the week is really my biggest battle? I tease you about Monday. That's really just a joke. Keep you griping ones away from me on Monday. That's not my worst day. My worst day is Saturday. Most preachers' worst day is Saturday. We just absolutely get hit between the eyes with Satan all the time. If Debbie and I are going to get in an argument or a fight, it's usually going to be on Saturday. And so we've learned how to settle it. She goes one end of the house and I go to the other on Saturday. We just don't fight. <laughs> it's a joke. We finally recognized that years ago. But yeah, he's always edging. Can, and you imagine why. If he can get the preacher uh, messed up on Saturday, he's got a hard time on Sunday. There's going to be a war. A war of the flesh. A war of the spirit. A war within you. But you determine the test. Which war is winning the battle in you? If you're always emotionally upset and in a fit and in a fine, listen, you're not winning the battle with the spirit. The spirit brings peace and joy and, and the presence of a holy God that loves you. And if you're always in a fit like what he's talking about here and envy and strife and all kinds of conflict, and every one of us have conflict, everyone in this room, we're going to have conflict somewhere. You can't avoid it. That doesn't do you any good. I don't like it any more than you do, but it's a part of life. But how does the Spirit help you to overcome it? You know, some people are just conflict-oriented people and they just excuse it. You need to settle it. You need to sell it for the peacefulness of your heart, the witness of your life, the strength of your family, and the Holy Spirit's work in the church. Gentle Christianity is what the Spirit's teacher teaches, and that's what the Beatitudes really teach. It doesn't mean weakness, it means strength. You know, I found it takes a whole lot more strength to be gentle than it does to be overbearing and try to get my own way. It takes a lot more strength for us to keep our temper when somebody's pouncing on our toes than to lose our temper and lose our tongue. It takes more of the power of the Spirit of God within us to follow Him when we know something is wrong and we want to correct it and He's saying, no, it's my job to correct it. It takes the Spirit of God to help us to be patient with people who are less and who have immaturity in their walk with Christ and have come out of backgrounds that we don't understand. You see, the whole day is put around one simple statement. Put on Christ through His teaching and He empowers you to walk it out and to do as well. 
to walk it out and to do His will. That's the purpose of the Christian life and the purpose of the church. Like I've taught you before, there's a purpose for this church. There's a plan. I know I'm to lead the way, but lead is what I have to do, but I have to do it under the Holy Spirit's unction. But you have to see it through the power of the Spirit. You have to help to do that and to guide that and direct that. You see, the Spirit of God needs to speak to you. You know, the sad thing about the plan of God in most churches, there's always a cold water committee somewhere. Y'all found, uh, I love discussion if somebody challenges me. I'm probably too quick to do that, but I don't mind staying on the ground in discussion. You know, some people just want to be against anything and everything and all things. Just to do it. God have mercy on them. Doesn't mean we close our eyes and let everything go by. Neither the preacher, the staff, the deacons, or anybody can see it all. We're all to be sensitive to Christ and to His calling. You see, the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God feels the membership, feels the membership, that's the picture of a Spirit-filled church. And it's the picture of Christ doing His work in us. If there's anything I hope I've ever taught you since I've been here, it's one thing. The church is not a democracy for everybody to vote, vote, vote. The church is a theocracy for God to speak to your heart and you represent purely what God is saying out of your heart towards the Lord. I think a lot of children of God are going to be in trouble for business meetings they voted the will of God out of. I think there's going to be folks standing at the judgment seat of Christ completely stripped of their crowns and everything else for the way that they've done things and stood in the way of God's church in going forward. Mike Eklund's done that. Some of you are going to do it because you've quenched the spirit in your family. You won't play out the biblical role. Men won't be men and women won't be women today. And fulfill the biblical role of oneness. You see, that's the Spirit's work, is to teach you how to walk in those manners. Now, listen, since we've said the negative, let's say the positive, and I'll be done. Remember the second thing that the Holy Spirit does. It emulates Christ in us, first of all, magnifies His life. But the second thing to it is, it's the only way to genuine, holy victory. And I'll guarantee you, you do what I've asked you to do today, in the Spirit's power, you'll get on shouting ground Christianity and you'll never, ever turn back from it. Father, we thank you today. We've had a great time in the house of God and listening to the power of the Holy Spirit and it teaching us. And Lord, we open our hearts to listen and to be taught. We need it. I need it. Cleanse us, almighty God. For we have sinned many times against you. We are, we are so frail and weak in your presence. We pray for your Spirit's power. We pray for your heart. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you emulate yourself within us and lead us to a victorious life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, listen, I'm going to ask you to stand.